Hey, hey, you guys, we are back. It's been a hot minute. I am Carmen, also known as the Tongue Trainer, and uh, we are going to be watching here for just a couple minutes. Uh, my associate Jess will be joining us. Uh, looks like she has already joined us, so we're gonna give her a minute to just get connected. A couple things. Let me view her request. Let me see if we could do. Couple things, you guys. First of all, um, yeah, I see some of my students in here. Love it. Um, I still don't see her connecting. Oh, here she's coming. Here she's coming. Um, hello. hello. Okay. So before we jump in, Jess, a couple things. Um, you guys, when we do these at seven o'clock at night, um, there's dogs and humans that live in this house. So I, I'm pretty sure they live in Jess's house, but also <laughs> live in mine. Um, also, there's weather, and Mother Nature is having a sense of humor right now. And so last night, Jess said she was under a tornado watch, so I'm not under anything like that. But it is super windy. If for some reason we were to lose our connection, we would just do it again another day, so we don't have to worry about it. Um, last, if you are joining us and you do not have your workbook, if you look in my Instagram bio, uh, in my link tree, you will find the link to download the workbook. Um, it just gives you a, a place to write um, questions or information, things that we talk about that resonate with you. But also at the end of it is the private eye list. And so I'm gonna just touch on that real quick so that we don't forget when Jess and I jump in and get excited here. Um, the private eye list gives you an opportunity to just identify things that your kiddo has a concern with um, and these are gonna be you know, certain symptoms or that kind of thing. So I had somebody ask a question today saying, how do I know if my kid needs an assessment or something? And I'm like, hey, grab that private eye list and just kind of look at that kind of stuff. So um, it is several pages long. So that will really clue you in. And I have a sneaking suspicion that a lot of you guys who have been with me for some time, you know this stuff. So with that said, um, Jess, are you, do you have nerves this time? Is this better than doing yeah. this the first time? <laughs> yes, definitely. Definitely better than the first time. <laughs> Wonderful. Awesome. So, um, so for those of you who do not know, Jess is my associate. She came on board in January. And the reason, um, I have some notes here. The reason we wanted to do this is because we there's things that we want parents to know so because she's working with a lot of kiddos i work with some of the world's worst kiddos um we just we want to just touch on some topics um and also help remove some of the overwhelm that we're supposed to help with so we're going to kind of just be powwowing there's really six topics um and this come whenever i do an education lecture or a parent group or a speaking event I like to lecture on six things. And this always just kind of allows us to kind of just touch on some stuff. You guys, we're not gonna get everything talked about tonight. Um, but I did this lecture several years ago, this parent workshop for um, an international parenting symposium. And it was so popular. And these are things that we need to talk about again. So that's why we're here, you guys. Um, but first, the biggest thing that keeps us doing this is because we have a why as big as Colorado, Wyoming, wherever, you know, what, whatever big state. Um, we have a special place in our heart for working with kiddos. And the reason is, is because kids don't know. Adults know if they have problems typically, but kids don't have a, a dog in this fight. So that's why Jess and I have such a special place in our heart to work with kids because we wholeheartedly believe that if we can help fix kiddos, then there won't be adults that need fixed. Okay. There won't be adults with obstructive sleep apnea. Um, it's not going to happen in our lifetime, sadly, but that that is our goal. So each of us have a very personal story on why we're here. Um, many of you guys, if you've been with me for some period of time, you know that my why is my sweet granddaughter, Lindsay, who is now an Henri teenager and about to get her driver's license. But when we started this journey with her, she was a kiddo who had been passed around from doctor to doctor. She was the only six-year-old I knew who carried around a nebulizer so she could take a breathing treatment. 
she was allergic to everything. She choked on everything because she couldn't um, chew and swallow correctly. She had three years of failed speech therapy and the speech therapist kept saying, well, it's not, the problem's not us, it's you. Uh, and come to find out she had a, a massive tongue tie. She was never going to be successful in speech therapy. And once we identified that tongue tie, we did myofunctional therapy. She has since, you know, fixed all of that stuff. So that's my why is her. Jess, I want to hear your story. What's your why? Perfect. So my why is actually my own child. And for a long time, my sweet daughter struggled to breathe. She would do like the alligator death roll, if you can say that. In bed, she would never sleep well. Um, she was struggling in school, um, struggled to breathe, was always my first kid that was sick and stayed sick for a long time. And I felt like by the time we got her better, she was good for a week and then she was down again for three weeks. And so she became my why of why I decided something I have got to find something, the root cause of what is going on with her, because it was concerning to me as a mom and I didn't want to put her on medication. I thought, I mean, she struggled with ADHD symptoms. You, she, I could write the book on the symptoms that she had that were, that matched perfectly. Um, and so that was my why is I had to find something that um, wasn't a medication or that I just had to, was a quick fix. And so that's why I chose to look into it more. And then it just became my passion and has been that way since. So you've got some exciting stuff about her. Do you want to, um, let's just dive into the airway awareness section. How's that work? Perfect. Yeah, um, great. So the biggest thing, um, you guys, and in the workbook, uh, airway awareness is like topic one and um, early ortho intervention is like, I think number six. We're going to put these together because they really do go together. I think this is probably the area, um, Jess, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the area in our practice where parents have the least amount of information. They feel the most discouraged. They feel the most overwhelmed because they don't know. Like we go to the orthodontist, we follow the, we follow the advice of our dentist that says, wait till all of the permanent teeth are in. And then there's people like you and I saying, yeah, that's, well, like once that happens, the prevention, you know, the pre preventative ship has sailed. Um, and so it's, it, it's the, the thing I think like parents just go cross eyed when I start talking about it. So the biggest thing you talked about ADHD. Um, I recently wrote a blog article about sleep apnea, sleep apnea in our children and ADHD. So you mentioned having all, you know, a lot of those symptoms. I think that parents want an answer for what's going on with their kiddo. Maybe this was kind of what was going on with you and your daughter. Like you just want an explanation. You don't care if it's wrong. If they tell you, hey, this is what's wrong with your kiddo. Here's a, here's a pill um, that makes a parent happy because then it's not, uh, then it's not questioned. Does that make sense? Like, hey, mm -hmm, exactly. we, have a, we have a diagnosis. <clears throat> So early inter so Jess, you to put you on the spot, how do how are you explaining to parents um, the importance of early intervention or why airway focus orthodontics is so important? So I a lot of times will go back to my personal story because I think if we can bring it to home to us that I've been through this, we know what to experience, we understand patient or parents' frustrations and um, they can, you know, they're how, why they're upset and why they're frustrated. And so I just think I explained to my parents how important it is for growth and development at an early age. And as a, you know, when I was in private practice and seeing patients all the time as a dental hygienist, I wanted, I didn't understand this. I didn't, I looked at it from a cleaning aspect. Braces are hard to clean and orthodontics are hard to take care of. And as a myofunctional therapist, I look at it as it is a growth and development. And if we can affect these children at such a young, at a younger age and start their growth and development in the correct way and their body and their face shape in the correct way, it is so, so important. And then when we're 12 and 13 and 14 years old, when we would traditionally be getting on braces or start, begin orthodontics, we already are several stages advanced if we start at a younger age. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, will you continue? So you started talking about your sweet daughter. So you, when you came on board, um, and even in this, in your, um, in the time of you doing your training to become a myofunctional therapist, I know that you were learning things that were 
obviously not mainstream to you. Um, you didn't you jump ship with your daughter? Was she already in orthodontic treatment with somebody else? And then you learned about airway ortho. And so you started all over. Can you speak to that? For sure. So I actually had her seeing a traditional orthodontist and we discussed airway as I was getting involved in myofunctional therapy and airway issues. And he told me specifically that what he was doing was scientifically based and that there wasn't anything to do with the airway. And that made me quite frustrated. And so I began even more research because then I would, that was a challenge to me. I'm going to find this out. I'm going to find out, is it, do I need to be concerned about airway or do I just do traditional orthodontics on her? And it by far and large, the more I researched, the more I spent time in an airway orthodontist office, I went and um, actually observed in his office and talked to him and just picked his brain and, his, and the um, gals that work for him, I picked their brains. And it has changed our life immensely. We drive about two and a half hours one way um, just to see an airway orthodontist that's close enough to us. And I will hands down, I, I won't ever go to somebody that doesn't believe in creating the airway. And Carmen, it's funny you say that because on our um, drive home just last week, my daughter <laughs> turned to me and she says, mom, I feel like I have a whole oxygen tank in the back of my throat. And just to have her do that has changed her life. I mean, this has changed not only her studies in school, her ADHD behaviors, her sleep patterns. She sleeps in one spot. She gets in bed and she wakes up in that exact same spot. I mean, this stuff is life changing. And I bring that home to all of the parents that this is life changing. And there are answers out there and there you just have to find them and you have to be willing to research. And I encourage parents, research, do your research. Don't just go on what I say or what Carmen says, do your mm -hmm. research. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, that's part of why we do so much of these conversations is so that parents can understand because it's so hard. I was telling somebody earlier today, um, when I was doing exams on a five-year-old, you know, that thank heavens she has the opportunity to, because they were referred to me by an orthodontist saying, hey, you need to meet with Carmen and you need to get started. And I told her about, you know, my sweet baby who's, who just turned 27, who I didn't know this stuff. And part of me, as I started to answer her, you know, just the conversation with her, I started to say, Thank God, because I would have spent a ton of money. But looking back at it, she's got two blown uh, joints that need to be replaced. She has a beautiful smile, but she has upper airway resistance syndrome and sleep apnea. And what I wouldn't give to go back in time to have somebody educate me, it would have overwhelmed me as a parent because I, I mean, we were on a budget. It was like a lot to think about, um, but airway trumps everything. And airway, that's why there's, you know, this connection, why we talk so much about uh, ADHD, obstructive sleep apnea, that kind of stuff. So, um, and sleep quality. That's the other thing. Many of you guys who follow me um, or email me, you have kiddos who do not sleep well. Um, I have been working with the youngest child that I have known to be being treated for uh, anxiety and depression at age five. Uh, and everything hurts. Everything with this poor little girl hurts all the time. And the thing is, is uh, good quality sleep moderates pain. So it's kind of like being a toddler who needs a nap. Like she feels that way all the time. So sleep is the bedrock of health. And so many parents are just like, yeah, my kids don't sleep good. They're never gonna sleep good. You know, I'll just have to get them out of the house and then I'll be able to sleep good. That's not, that's not good. Um, Jess, anything else? What should we, what else should we add to airway awareness? You know, I think a lot of it is, I think people just need to understand that if your body is continually in this fight or flight mode from having your airway blocked, I mean, just think of it. If you're running from a tiger and then you can't see the tiger anymore and your body is able to relax and then you see the tiger and you're running, you know, if your body is con constantly in this fight or flight, then how do we expect our children to relax? Or how do we expect them to do well in school? Or how do we expect them to be in these, you know, positions that take a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of effort? It's really hard for these younger kids. And so if there are ways that we can help them to be able to relax or their bodies to relax, them to be able to breathe better, it's huge. And like I've, I've said, I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it within my own children and it's phenomenal. It, it makes a world of a difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that kind of, I want to segue into, so where do we find these humans, these magical unicorns? 
they are not on every corner. Okay. And that's one thing that Jess and I do in the, in the practice is we help guide you when we know something about your needs or your child's needs. Um, but, but airway focus orthodontist, they're, they're getting to be more and more, um, thankfully, but they are still, I think probably predominantly what's out there is the, the older antiquated, less preventative way of thinking. We want to fix the kid before the head develops. So, the head is 90% developed by age 10 to 12. Girls are going to be ahead of boys. So waiting until, you know, if your dentist says, hey, wait till your kiddo is 13. No, 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 no. In fact, I was uh, working on a lesson today for my students. Um, there are some dental appliances that are, are working on two year olds. Which is awesome. Awesome. So, um, so you just have to research when you're looking for somebody who is an airway focused orthodontist. I always tell my clients. Google, you can Google. I mean, if I don't have a direct referral for a, a client, I will tell you to Google and then I will tell you to go to their website. And if they have anything about airway focused orthodontics, what it means, if they have it buried deep in their website, you guys, they're not an airway focused orthodontist because in today's day and age, that needs to be front and center. Would you agree, Jess? Absolutely. Like they need to tell you absolutely up front. And, and, th and they're going to use some of the words that you hear people like Jess and I say, you know, or the same concept. And if you are already working with an orthodontist who is not airway focused, or if they, if, if they don't know anything about myofunctional therapy, I think in an airway focused orthodontic office, the odds of them not knowing about Mayo are pretty slim these days because that's really the collaboration. Like there's a ton of training on that. Um, if they want to pull teeth out of your kiddo's face, no. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was going to see if I had my new favorite book here. Um, I do. Let me grab it. Total side note, parents, but you want to read and understand what's going on with your kiddo's face right here. Um, this is, I, I found out about this book from, one of my providers in Florida who gives this to her client, her, her patients to understand facial development. Um, you don't pull teeth out of a small mouth and make it, you make it a smaller mouth. So that's no good. Um, anything else? Am I missing anything, Jess? I think you're hitting, I mean, bedwetting, bedwetting is something that we have been, we've seen in some of a lot of our clients. Yeah. If your kiddos have um, issues with bedwetting, that's something that is airway related. So there's so many things that we can tie back to the airway and just having an open, healthy airway is 100% the most important thing. Yep. Um, grinding, bedwetting, and ADHD diagnosis um, is, is kind of like this, I wouldn't call it a magical triad, but when we see that in paperwork, we start to say, uh, there's a concern. I also had a kiddo not too long ago who had a sleep study done and his sleep study was so poor, they just called it inconclusive and swept it under the rug. This was a kiddo who was 13, wetting the bed, grinding his teeth, um, you know, lots and lots of concerns. And they just said it was inconclusive. So if that's the case, you also, you know, parents want to fight for their kiddo. Okay, Jess, let's move on to the next topic since we have six. Um, so tongue ties. Um, so I talked about my granddaughter. Um, we have some chicken scratches written here and then we'll just kind of dive in. So the biggest thing, Jess, what's the biggest thing that comes to your mind when you think tongue tie? Facial development is probably the most number one is just how our face, and I know Carmen and I will hit this all night, but facial development is so important in guiding the face and, and the tongue. The tongue can guide the face and, and, and uh, guide our development. Yeah, absolutely. That was the first thing that I had written down here. So, so when we talk about facial development, you guys, and, and malocclusion or crowded teeth, many, many of the parents of kiddos that we work with, they just think that Johnny has daddy's teeth or yeah, we got the, we got the Wilkie smile or whatever. That is, the mouth is B is less and less genetic and it's more and more epigenetic and, and habit. So because of the sad American diet, um, which we'll talk about with chewing here in just a minute. Um, the, the high percentage of people who are nasal or are mouth breathing. We, as a society are starting to have longer, narrower faces. Um, no muscle tone uh, and lots and lots of dental crowding. So if anybody's ever heard of, of the work of Dr. Weston price, 
He studied um, poor cultures. Why did they have big, uh, big smiles, room for all the teeth? You know, pulling wisdom teeth is just is not a rite of passage. Just because it's normal doesn't mean that it is the norm. And so in these populations that he studied, these cultures that were not exposed to the sad American diet and actually ate their their native diet, they chewed and they had room for all of um, all of their teeth back to facial development. Um, so a tongue tie that's left untreated is going to hold the development of the face back. Okay, so that's a biggie. Um, another area that we see a lot of is speech. And the thing about speech is, again, you know, talking a little bit about my granddaughter, she wasn't going to be successful in speech because she had this tongue tie. So half of the muscles are responsible for shape, half are responsible for placement. So if somebody's just banging their head, banging their head, banging their head, they're never going to be successful because if nothing changes, if nothing changes type of thing. So we see tons of kiddos who have speech impediments or they just have, it's just kind of gone by the wayside. The other thing, this is going to piss somebody off. Um, Jess, and I don't know if I've ever told you this, I'm sure I have, um, but years ago I did an exam on a speech therapist who was a speech therapist in public school. She was also learning about myofunctional therapy and I thought what a glorious mix that she would be able to do both. And the state that she she worked in in a public school. She said, well, I don't know about it being this way in any other state, but just so you know, I work in a school and if we can't fix it, we can't see it. So I did an expose on Instagram like I was mad because my granddaughter had been in speech in a in, in a school setting and I know what kind of what it was. So that was the whole thing is that speech therapist said, if you, you know, because if a kiddo is in a school speech program, everything should not, it should not be of cost to them. So if they're gonna refer somebody out for a tongue tie, that who's gonna pay for it? So they weren't allowed to see it. So I did that Instagram and I vented and ranted about it. And do you think I had a lot of other speech therapists that private messaged me and told me it's a fact? So that's really sad. So that's also why I speak out about it. <laughs> um, what else? Swallow. Talk to me swallowing. about the swallow. What so are you you're seeing with the kiddo swallowing? So swallow, obviously your posture is going to affect your swallow. So if you are rolled shoulders, leaning forward, your posture, you will not be swallowing correctly. And so we really focus on the swallow. Now swallowing is more advanced, but that's one of the things we really want to get to with myofunctional therapy. We start with, um, you know, nasal breathing and lips closed, tongue on the tongue, um, where it needs to be on the top of the mouth. But then we start to swallow and we see choking and we see um, kids, you know, just that tongue, if it's in that airway at all, these kids really, really struggle. And so retraining kids to, to swallow is one of the, our main jobs. I mean, mm -hmm. something that we really want to get to and be part of. Well, and before they're older, so I always, you know, I talk about my oldest client was 79 when we started therapy. She had been swallowing wrong for a minute, for a minute. And so it was really, really hard. And I have a large population of clients, I would say 60 to 80. And I always say half are mad and half are madder because the ones that are the half that are mad, they're just mad that they knew they had a problem and they didn't do anything about it. And the other ones are like mad that nobody knew, nobody told them. And so when we talk about kiddos, parents are like, hey, my kids, at least he's choking down his asparagus, I'm good. No, but we want to get it correct so that, um, number one, so there's not a tongue thrust um, and a tongue thrust is not the problem. It is a symptom of a bigger problem, you guys. So, um, but, but it's a concern. Um, also, if you have a kiddo who's open mouth chewing, it's not a manners thing. I mean, my dad used to backhand me across the table if I was chewing with my mouth open. Now it's that your kid's trying to breathe and eat at the same time. All right, Jess, let's talk about this one. I don't think this gets a lot of coverage. So social consequences of a tongue tie. Yes. So I think I truly believe that there are social, social and emotional consequences of having a tongue tie. So this not only affects speech, um, children that have a speech impediment or 
anything like that, that they aren't able to manipulate their tongue the way that they want to. Um, they, you know, can get teased at school. They can get teased by their peers. And that's not where we want to have our kids. We want to, you know, the world throws enough at our kids that we want them to be able to just be built up. And by having a speech impediment, um, Carmen, I saw a client just the other day, one of our clients, and literally he's struggled with speech through therapy. And he's actually had two releases, had to, just went through a second release. And, and we've worked on tongue placement and we've worked on, um, different words, just that he says, we're not speech therapists, but that we work with our different therapies that we do. And he is speaking, he is saying his THs, he's mm -hmm. saying his S's, and it's phenomenal by just being able, being able to remove that tongue and have it where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. He's speaking and his mom has noticed and he's noticed. And so to me, that's pretty cool. That's mm -hmm. pretty awesome that we are removing this social and emotional consequence of having a tongue tie that he could have had until he was 50. Yep, absolutely. And on that same note, two of my favorite stories about this same topic, I worked with a man and a woman, adult, not, not together. Um, and I remember the male telling me when I was talking just about like social stuff and that kind of stuff, his response to me was, I just think I'm, I just think I've been shy. Like that was his personality. And I really like, I'm kind of an over the top human. And so I just thought, is he the right person now? Is this a good mix? So I went ahead and worked with him and I thought, oh my gosh, it's going to like, we're just going to be like oil and water. I watched his personality change as he did his therapy and had his tongue released. It was so weird. And I told him that I didn't tell him till the very end of therapy. And I said, you know, I remember you telling me, I think I just, uh, I think I'm just shy and i watched your personality blossom he was so funny and he was so outgoing but he just had that um for whatever reason whether it was speech a lot of people also with a tongue tie they have trouble projecting their voice so a lot of them have just been beat down over their life of like speak up come on you know they just have these little meek voices um but also the other human was a beautiful woman and she said i've been called uh, a beautiful my whole life, antisocial, um, unapproachable, you know, not exactly things that women or anybody wants to be call, called, but not exactly her. And she said, Carmen, I don't want to go to a party. I don't want to go talk. I don't want to go be social. And I certainly don't want to go to a party and have a glass of wine and then trip over my words. So again, I watched her just blossom as she at her release and then was able to vocalize more. So absolutely. Um, so I always, you know, hit on that when parents are saying, well, can't I just let Johnny deal with this tongue tie when he gets a little bit older? And I'm like, please don't, please don't, because there's so many things. And, but Johnny doesn't even get a vote in that, you know? Now, one last thing that I do, well, actually I have written here, oral health and cleaning teeth. So that's one thing that a lot of people don't realize with a tongue tie is the tongue needs to be able to do its job. And part of that is helping your kid chew and also helping your kid clean its their teeth. So if you have a kiddo that has a lot of decay, perhaps maybe the tongue can't reach to do the job that it's supposed to. Um, okay, did we do good, Jess? And chewing, yeah, I think chewing too goes along with tongue, tongue tie just because if we can't manipulate the food, or get the food where we need it to to begin that swallow it it or excuse me it affects the swallow big time absolutely absolutely okay so let's, let's talk about a couple things i have written down don't just have it done you need myo you need a great release and it can cause trauma so i'm going to touch on the can cause trauma part um and this is mostly not related to tongue tie but I was explaining this to a parent today who had a kiddo who maybe needed a tongue tie release, but at five, like compliance was not going to be there. And I just told mom, like, we can't just, you can't just sit on a kid and get them to do their post procedure care. Okay. It's one thing when you have a baby and you have to get in there and you have to pull that wound open. Um, the baby can't really fight you off, but a five-year-old with a rack of teeth, certainly can and and the biggest thing is is i always tell parents we don't want to create an oral aversion with your kiddo 
this story is not related to a tongue tie, but it is related to um, a dental office. So, and it's, and it's happened more than once. So I've consulted on cases around the world where we have kiddos um, on feeding tubes. Again, not related to a tongue tie, but related to some trauma in the dental office, something happened, kiddo now no longer wants to take food intraorally. That's why we can't just say, well, I'm gonna just have my kid do it and muscle through it. Um, that's a terrible idea because your kid might be 50 years old and still bawling every time they have to go to the dentist or maybe just not even go. I have met so many people who are young and they have full dentures in today's day and age, you just wouldn't expect that you would see a lot of that. Um, so that kind of leads me to just don't have it done. If you have a kiddo who has a tongue tie, you like we want to do things right. You want to make sure and do myo correct, pre procedure, the full rehabilitation after. It's not just doing therapy for a week or two before the release and doing nothing after. That's where somebody like Jess and I, who we work with, hundred. I've worked with thousands of tongue ties. Um, some of the worst that doctors have seen around the world. So you just don't want to jump into it. Um, you, so you need Mayo. Uh, Jess, what do you say about getting a good release? That's just so important. <laughs> if you don't, especially, I mean, there are situations where you do need a second release. Um, kiddos that are super tied down or adults that are really, really tied down. A lot of times they just can't get the full release that first time. However, it is so important to go to somebody that has done thousands and thousands of these and that sees thousands and thousands of patients every single day to do a release. And the reason for that is you don't want somebody cutting your hair that this is their first time, right? That they, they're trimming your hair, chopping your hair. Um, you want somebody that's done it before, that's worked with color and all of that, you know, different colors that we want to put in our hair. Well, now we, it's super important to get to find a provider that has done this, that knows their way around a release, that understands the muscles of the tongue, that understands how deep they need to go instead of, you know, maybe just a little tiny nick that looks like a paper, paper cut. Yeah. Because I'm telling you right now, those clients we've worked with that have those paper cuts, you, it's just not enough. We just don't get the full function of the tongue. And what we're looking for in all of this is function. And if we can't achieve function, then we have to readdress it. And I don't like mm -hmm. to have to do that. Yeah, I don't like mulligans when it comes to tongue ties. I always like to use the example, you guys, there's a condition called syndactyly. And so that's when like the fingers are fused together. So when I teach this to my students, um, I talk about like if, if this hand is fused together and it wants to play the piano, it doesn't do any good to unfuse it only for the top itch. It doesn't do anything. And so that's the biggest thing is for this hand to have any hope at playing the piano, you have to have a full release. And that's the same thing with the tongue. And so just going to Joe Blow, all dentists know how to do a tongue tie release, you guys, and most of them should not be. And that's because they learned it back in dental school. Um, they're not doing a lot of them. Uh, it looks like somebody cut underneath their tongue with a chip. And it's so disheartening heartening to us because our clients work so hard to prepare and we want that good release. So that's part of why it's important to work with somebody who has a large professional network and they know what they're doing. So sometimes it's shocking to my clients when they live in um, Arkansas and they drive to Dallas to see a provider, but that's because the person in Dallas knows what the hell he's doing. He's not just saying, oh yeah, I can just release that. So in my practice, my clients are required to travel up to eight hours one way. Um, I'm based out of Colorado. I have clients from come from five states away to see my my favorite human on earth here in Colorado. So it's, uh, and it's Jessica's favorite yes. human, yes. <laughs> human yes. on yes. earth too. <laughs> um, shout, out, shout out to Dr. Biedemann. Yes. Um, I, think, I think we're good there. Yep. Tongue ties. We're not sure. going to get it all talked about, you guys. So I have to remember that we will have to do this again. Next, third topic: oral rest posture. So, what's why is oral rest posture important? Facial development. We just really want to get that facial development where we need it and where it's proper. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about symmetrical. So, our I was concerned when when we went in and had some about you know our consults and they really wanted to do some big expansion on my daughter it, it was concerning to me and then the more and more i learned and studied and read articles and i mean she 
is now very symmetrical compared like she's grown a nose i mean it's the joke at our house that she actually grew a nose she hasn't had a nose and it's been very flat and a button nose and she has grown a nose and it's pretty cool to go with her oxygen air tank yes yes so she not only has a nose but now she's got a full oxygen tank so it's pretty cool it's pretty amazing stuff um so a little bit about oral rest posture you guys so what is correct oral rest posture the entire tongue tip to tail needs to create a seal across the roof of the mouth so if you have a kiddo who is walking around tongue open tongue open mouth open tongue out um that's not correct oral rest posture so the tongue is nature's braces it needs to be up that's going to help guide that cranial facial development and then also when the lips are closed with nasal breathing, that is also going to help. So that's why that's super important. So facial development, number one. Um, and then also posture and swallowing. So this, your posture is so important for everything, ears over the shoulders. Um, this kind of goes total sidebar real fast, but when we're talking about orth airway orthodontics versus like a conventional orthodontist, a conventional orthodontist is a tooth beautician. They're going to just get your teeth into shape, okay? They're just going to shape them. They're going to cosmetically, like, make it look good. But somebody who is more, more of an airway focused, they are worried about you as a skeleton, as a structure. So that's why you don't wait until somebody's 13, because those bones are formed. You know, the head, the head is formed. So, um, so when somebody has low resting tongue posture, when the tongue is down, the frontal muscular chain of the body collapses, and that also collapses the back of the body. Breathing, your posture system is involved in correct breathing. How many people can belly breathe if they're bent over in a forward fold? No. no. And so if we're upright, our humans can breathe correctly. They can also swallow correctly. So a lot of parents, when I do an exam, and then I say, oh yeah, and by the way, I'm not the only human on your kiddos healthcare team. We need somebody who does body work. And by body work, I don't mean getting a massage for your kiddo. I mean a good functional chiropractor or even better, a physical therapist. As I help unwind your kiddo, we need somebody to stack him or her back up so that we can have good posture, so we can have correct tongue posture, correct breathing, correct swallowing. Um, Last, Jess, what do you say about tongue posture and sleep? Super, super important. This is something that we evaluate as myofunctional therapists, obviously. And again, going back to that fight and flight, if your tongue is constantly in the back of your throat and taking up space in the back of your throat, your body will be in fight or flight, or you, it will be waking up throughout the night, multiple times a night, instead of being able to get that deep REM sleep and go through all your sleep cycles like you're supposed to do. Um, so tongue posture, just definitely we work on that. And especially at nighttime when we aren't awake to say, hey, this needs to be up there. So muscle memory in that, in that particular situation is super important in order for our body to do it automatically. Absolutely. So it seems like a good time to talk about four goals of myofunctional therapy. So correct tongue posture, which I just said, tip to tail in the roof of the mouth, creating a seal. Um, mouth is closed, lips are sealed. Nasal breathing is the predominant way of breathing and then the swallow correct and normalized. So not everybody needs all four of those things. I would say most of my world needs the swallowing for sure. Um, and, a, and we work with a lot of mouth breathers as well. So that is that too. Okay, next topic. I'm trying to watch in the clock. We're good. Um, chewing, 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 chewing. Again, talks about it in this book, which I love. Um, also, another great book for parents, The Dental Diet by Dr. Stephen Lynn, um, talks about the face in the stadium. So if you've had me do an exam for you or your kiddo, you know that I talk a lot about the, the, fa yep. <laughs> the <laughs> facial development, the size of your stadium, um, and your teeth being the chairs. You cannot, if your stadium is poured too small, you cannot put all of the all, all of your chairs in okay so that's when you get that dental crowding no it's not grandpa's mouth it's it's a facial development thing um obstructive sleep apnea is a facial development thing because the bones of the face don't get big enough um so chewing is a big one i get asked a lot like why doesn't the face develop correctly um lots of reasons <laughs> chewing one of those 
Um, so the sad American diet, a lot of our kiddos are drinking their applesauce pouches. They're drinking their baby food. They're um, eating processed foods because Johnny will only eat a hot dog. Johnny eats 47 hot dogs in a week, that type of stuff. Also, because we don't want our kiddos to, ch to choke, we cook everything to death and we cut it into these little teeny tiny pieces. So having our kiddos chew, 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 chew is what we want. Um, nasal breathing puts an expansive force on the face as does chewing. So we work with our kiddos in therapy a lot on chewing. Number one, to overcome that open mouth chewing, um, but also if they've had a tongue tie, if they've had it released, if they just simply have impairment and no tongue tie, the tongue needs to know how to help chew and keep the food on the chewing surface of the teeth. The cheeks help keep it on there from the outside, but the tongue needs to help do it on the inside. Um, but we work with kiddos on bilateral chewing. How many of you guys in the audience actually chew your food on both sides or to the consistency of a smoothie? not very many because nobody knows that and a lot of kiddos especially those with tongue ties as they transition from solid foods they tend to be a fast eater or a slow eater and slow often comes from that tongue tie it's a lot of work it's just they're so slow and others eat really really fast they chew it a couple times and down the hatch so we look at chewing with our kiddos. Like I, I have them chew, they spit their food into a little cup so they can see what it looks like. Then they learn their chewing exercises and then they compare. And one should look like the consistency of a smoothie. What are you seeing in practice, Jess? What, what, the same. How are your kiddos chewing? <laughs> yeah, the same thing. A lot of times I have them do like a dried fruit or something. And then when they do spit it out, it is just not, I mean, you can see why we, this goes into digestion issues, which is a whole mm -hmm. other complex um, thing, but we, we, our kids are taking in all this air, kids and adults both, and we're just aren't chewing our food. It's solid pieces. And then we worry about stomach aches and, you know, that all the digestion problems that can happen, happen or excessive belching. But when you're taking in all that air in big pieces, that's going to happen. I'm always shocked at just how fast <laughs> they eat. I had a kiddo several years ago who was my biggest uh, and, and my proudest digestive case to, to date. Um, she thought the faster that she ate, the more she would be able to, in, to taste her food. And I was like, oh, that is so not, that's not true. That's not true. Um, so facial development, chewing, chewing, chewing. Somebody emailed me the other day and said, what do you suggest? Beef jerky. There, there are, there are no kids. I, I think about me as a kiddo when I could get, have a piece of beef jerky this big, you know? <laughs> so like beef jerky, chew, chew, chew. Um, not anybody gets really excited about raw vegetables. Um, but I see a lot of kiddos who just can't, like they can't chew a baby carrot because they don't know how to work with that in their mouth. Mm -hmm. Um, also, so parents are exacerbating it and that goes back to don't just let your kid live on smoothies, drinking their food, have them chew food. Um, and then also, again, don't just ignore myofunctional impairments. If, if you have a mouth breathing kiddo, root cause. And that's this whole, the whole point of this lecture tonight is just root cause. Like what, like what is going on with your kiddo? Why is your kiddo mouth breathing? Oh, nasal breathing is next. So I'm going to just shut up and we're going to move on to that. Um, so I already mentioned expensive force um, on the face for the facial de development. Okay. Um, so maybe nasal breathing is so important. Um, next, I have tonsils. So this tends to be one that we are seeing a lot. I'm sure that, well, Jess, I know you, you are because we're having some challenges in our practice um, with the, when I say challenges, I just mean that parents are like, hey, it's a body part and I don't want to just rip it out. But if we have a kiddo, um, we have seen kiddos that have diagnosed sleep apnea, parents don't want to take the tonsils out. It kind, they kind of have to come out, guys, got to come out. Um, they, they're not going to just magically shrink. If you have a kiddo who has enlarged tonsils, they've chronically been enlarged. Um, they're not just going to magically get small. And so it's really hard. We're always open to helping parents understand and see what we can do. But if we have a kiddo who just has these massive kissing tonsils in the back of the throat, they're just gagging and choking. They, the, they are the obstruction. So they got to 
come out of there? And it's really hard. Like we can't, you can't just wait to see if they're going to get smaller. Do you have anything else to add to that, Jess? No, I think you covered that one really good. I think, you know, I think we as parents need to be open. We need to do our, again, do our research and, and what we have seen clinically, what we have seen, we just don't see them shrinking to the point that, you know, when they are that big or huge kissing tonsils that's where you know it gets gets really hard mm -hmm. i mean that's that's, yeah. that's a that's a touchy a very touchy subject with some parents and so you know we work around it and we do the best we can yeah yeah absolutely um so another thing that i have on nasal breathing here is we've kind of touched on it a little bit um for the mental health so i mentioned the little girl that i was working with that has anxiety and depression, um, ADHD. So that's a big thing. So another thing that I'm running into with a lot of parents is they say, you know, Johnny has, you know, mouth breathing, but what do what do we do about that? And again, going back to that root, root cause, of course, we wanna know if Johnny can breathe through the nose. That's the biggest thing, because if there's plumbing issues, then we there's a bigger fish to fry. Um, airway trumps everything. So if we have a kiddo that needs to, to go through expansion first before we start working with them, that's a possibility. Um, I forget where I was going with this. Um, tell me, Jess, what was I talking about? <laughs> I, I wish I could pick up there, but I can I add, I was reading a research article on sensory processing disorder and it was talking about how kiddos that mouth breathe aren't getting their sensor senses through like their their nose and their eyes because they're you know just mouth open tongue out and so i think it's really important that we realize we've got to hit all of those senses for our kids mm -hmm. age to you know for developmental um for and all of that and so i think that's really important and then our kids find that they aren't uh, you know, as used to sensory, different sensory items and stuff, because they are using their mouth, they're not using their nose as a filter. And so I think that's pretty important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'll think and, about, go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead. And I just think we need to figure out, you know, can they not nasal breathe? Or are they just choosing not to because they're seeing, you know, adults around them that maybe are, are mouth breathing or their peers are mouth breathing or, you know, and with COVID and masks and all of that, I, we've seen more and more and more kiddos that didn't breathe, you know, you threw their noses, we wearing their masks at the time. And so we're retraining that or reteaching kids. Hey, it's okay. We need to breathe out of our nose. Yep. And so that, that's been an interesting concept. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'll think, I'll think at like midnight, I'll decide yeah. what, what it was. We were talking time. about, yeah, the anxiety and your, your kiddo that had anxiety yeah. and they, I think they get labeled sometimes. And I don't like that. I don't like that. These kiddos are getting labeled when, why don't we again try to find the root cause and that's what i think carmen and i you know are based on is let's find the root cause of this versus let our children experience some pretty rough times exactly now i remember what i was talking about yes i love it yeah <laughs> um I, I love it when my brain comes back to me um so kiddos who are mouth breathing and and we're looking for like the why the why the why Diet is a huge part of it. So sugar, gluten, alcohol, obviously not for a kiddo. I mean, hopefully your kid's not tipping back a martini, but I have plenty of adults that, that have alcohol. Um, alcohol, dairy, gluten, and sugar are the four biggest inflammatory causing agents. So that's one of the, the uh, that's the other struggle with parents. Like they don't understand, you know, like why do we have to get the tonsils out if they're an issue? But then also I will have parents where they just they are spinning their wheels, spinning their wheels. And we're looking at why do we have congestion? And that's a big thing. So diet, um, I had an, uh, a question about this the other day. Also uh, chemicals in our house, synthetic smells. So if you have a kiddo who's mouth breathing and you're trying to figure out why, people like me and Jess are gonna help, like we're gonna ask these questions. What about your laundry detergent? Are you using Tide Sheets? You know, those are things that you don't think about, um, but also pets is a biggie. I had a kiddo who we could not um, get past the mouth breathing until they stopped having the, the cat sleep on the pillow because the kiddo was allergic to that. So that's why we say like, hey, we work more in wellness than we just work in this area because this is attached to everything else. It's kind of important. Um, Jess. We hit them all. Let I think we hit. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I was like, wait, I think 
we had. So we talked about um, airway, airway uh, awareness, tongue ties, oral rest, posture, chewing, nasal breathing, and that's right, early orthodontic intervention was um, back at the beginning. So where do we go from here? What was the whole point of this? To help you understand um, where you may or may not be getting good advice. There's lots of other humans like us out there that have this knowledge, um, possibly your dentist, possibly your orthodontist. Uh, also, don't be afraid to get more than one opinion. Again, I did an exam today with a mom. They're getting their third opinion. And I love three opinions. And that's because you may have, you know, somebody says this, somebody says this. Well, that third one is probably going to have something in common with one of these. Okay. Um, but again, if somebody wants to pull teeth out of your kiddo's mouth, run out of the building like it's on fire, if they tell you that your kiddo is a little bit tongue tied, that they be fine, okay? It's like being a little, little bit pregnant. No, no, that's actually not true. So, so not all tongue ties need to be released. Most of them do, uh, at least most of the ones that I see, um, because it's going to, again, it goes back to this. It goes back to having that full range of movement. Ultimately, our goal is to not have people dying from complications of sleep apnea, and that means getting the tongue to the roof of the mouth, being able to uh, have that correct tongue posture and get the tongue out of the throat. And if they can't comfortably get it there, it's going to be hard. Um, Jess, any last thoughts? Just one last thing, too. I think when you go down a myo journey, you need to understand that we are part of a team. And Carmen mentioned that before. But it's not just a myofunctional therapist. We also have an amazing network of orthodontists, sleep medicine doctors, all of these people that are on our team that are willing to help us get and help you or your kid get achieve the best health results. So it doesn't just, I mean, it could start with a myofunctional therapist, but we also work in conjunction with so many other providers, which is pretty phenomenal. Yep, absolutely. Um, and, and we help you find those people if it's not, if we don't know somebody who, who can help you. So we don't just throw you out there. Hey, Jess, I see a feature on here. There are a couple questions. So, um, I, I love technology, but also sometimes I'm terrified to actually try and click on it and see. <laughs> so somebody, um, says somebody, um, Michelle T says, wondering if waiting after age three is better uh, from that standpoint, though I know it'll mean more myo. So I, I'm thinking that um, they're talking about, about the tongue tie. So that's a great question. So we did not touch on a, 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 an appropriate age. You guys, if a tongue tie is not a breastfeeding issue, it needs to be left alone until a child is old enough to comprehend, comply, and cooperate with therapy. They need to have what's called the volitional control or voluntary control of the muscles. So again, if you have a kiddo who has a tongue tie and your dentist says, oh, look at your two-year-old, let's just get in there and take care of that. Um, I know this is a strong statement. A hundred percent of my clients who have had releases before as a child um, or, or sometime earlier, like toddlerhood, they end up having them again. So that's a pretty strong, and of course, that's just my um, anecdotal evidence in my practice. Um, but if it's not a breastfeeding issue, somebody asked me today what they should do about a nine month old, somebody else about a five month old, but if they're breastfeeding fine, like, eh, you know, you've got that whole craniofacial development thing. Um, so ideally you would fix it as a kiddo. Um, but after that, so to answer this question, do I wait till after age three? Absolutely, um, more like age four. And sometimes it can be longer than that because we start working with kiddos at age four, that does not mean they're ready for a release. I have a kiddo right now who I have been working with. The end of the month will, will be a year. He is finally ready for a release. So um, it's been a lot of work and, and we started when he was when he was four, so now he's five. Um, I'm gonna see if there's any more of these questions that I can it's, answer. It's um, definitely a marathon, not a sprint too. I think that's something that we need to understand that it's a marathon, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes effort on the parent side. Um, or as an adult, it takes, you know, serious dedication to make sure that your therapy is getting complete. Yeah, absolutely. I always say it's a self-motivated therapy. You have to do the work to, to get the results and we're there to support you through it. So 
Um, so what do you do from here if you suspect it? You or your kiddo? I mean, this we were talking about kiddos. Um, the first step is to start with an exam. That's where we learn and we know more about you, what your concerns are. Um, like Jess was saying, we are part of your comprehensive health care team, but we are not the first person. We not, aren't always that first person. So um, sometimes we need airway. Well, a lot of times we need airway ortho first. Okay, so we guide you through that. But we don't know. We can't comment until we know more about um, what your needs are, what your goals are for therapy. Uh, I see a question here popped up. When you release, is it a uh, is that a procedure like surgery or how is it released? That's a great question. So a tongue tie is released with a procedure called a phrenectomy, a frenulotomy, a frenulectomy, just depends on what part of the world you're in. Um, somebody goes in and re releases that tissue. So that's a collagen fiber. Um, and the best, easiest way I describe it is when they release it, it's like a run in pantyhose. It just opens it, it up. So some doctors do different procedures. It's not about the method, it's about the brains in that person's head, okay, and their experience. So that's how it is released. Um, it is not necessarily, or it is not necessary in most cases that a child be put to sleep. Uh, I don't know if this is just um, a, a, a somebody's pre preconceived notion. I'm not sure, but um, it's generally done in a dental office with local anesthetic or sometimes just topical gel. A kid does not need general anesthetic for this. And quite honestly, we don't want it because a kiddo needs to be able to participate to have their suction. Okay, so there are certain things that they need to do. Um, that is it. I see some other questions. I missed them. Um, you guys, there's tons of resources both on my Instagram, also on my face, um, on my on on the website. Okay, uh, download this workbook. There is also my full parent workshop on this same topic, root cause resolution. But ultimately, if you have questions or if you go through this. Um, the parent private eye thing that's in this workbook and you say, hey, my kid has concerns, don't stick your head in the sand. So many parents, like that's what Jess and I are here for, to help educate you and help you understand why this stuff is important because we've mopped a lot of mama tears and the, those are people that are like, hey, I knew something was going on. I asked my pediatrician, they said I was fine. 99% of pediatricians, by the way, don't think that um, tongue ties are a thing. So it, it, that's just what's hard is because there's people that we trust and they're not giving us the most up-to-date information. Um, so yeah, schedule your exam if you have questions. Uh, anything you wanna say in closing, Miss Jess? I think it's great. I just encourage parents to, if, to fight for your kid, uh, kids if you feel like there's something out there that you're missing or um, I haven't heard yet. Look for it. Do some research and reach out and we'd be you know, happy to help you and get you on a journey that has helped both of us immensely, both of our, our families. Um, yeah. And yeah. So I'm sure that's it. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you for awesome. showing up. 759. We made it. Check it out. Um, awesome. Yep. Awesome. You guys, thanks for being here with us. Remember, um, you can always contact us if you have questions and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.